Welcome to the Healing Trauma Podcast, a space for those who are healing from complex and developmental trauma. Introducing your host, Monique Cohen, a certified trauma recovery coach, survivor, and thriver. The intent of the podcast is to provide helpful information with insight that can validate, encourage, and support you on your healing journey. You're going to hear stories from other survivors and trauma experts, featuring therapists, coaches, and practitioners. We will open up the conversation on effective trauma healing modalities, practices, and tools. If you are interested in trauma recovery coaching, as well as recommended books and healing resources, head over to www.thehealingtraumapodcast.com. And now, here is your host, Monique Coven. This episode is sponsored by Tyndale House Publishers. In Change Your Brain Every Day, psychiatrist and clinical neuroscientist Dr. Daniel Amen draws on over 40 years clinical practice with tens of thousands of patients to give you the most effective daily habits he has seen that can help you improve your brain, master your mind, boost your memory, and make you feel happier, healthier, and more connected to those you love. Pre-order now at Tyndale.com. On today's episode, I'm going to be sharing a really fantastic conversation I had with clinical psychologist Susanna Kujaris. And Susanna is a trauma psychologist, and she specializes in somatic therapy. She does a lot of other types of therapies, but I find that she has so much wisdom and so much knowledge. And really, I wanted to bring her on because I know that she can open up the understanding of trauma therapy in relation to what's happening in our bodies and somatics. So I'm so happy to share this with you, and I hope that you'll find this episode helpful on your healing journey. Hi, Susanna. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Monique. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm really happy to have this conversation with you. I feel like you have a whole wealth of wisdom that you can share with us, so I'm I'm grateful you're here. Oh, thank you. So we're going to talk, I have questions for you and really, you know, my, my goal is to help survivors just understand more of not only what they're experiencing, but also what, what are ways that can just help them when they seek help uh, to make the, even the process easier or more understandable or more digestible. And so I thought, you know, you are a uh, somatic psychologist, a trauma psychologist, actually, but I know that you have training in um, somatics and you use uh, somatic therapies and a lot of other therapies in the, in the, you know, healing work that you do, the therapeutic work. So thought we can talk about that. And mm-hmm. one of the first things that I think when I think of, for me anyway, when I think about somatic there somatic therapies and bottom up versus cognitive what was really for me such a huge um light bulb was when i started to understand that our trauma responses are reflective meaning they just happen they're not something that we necessarily choose or like decide to do but that they're reflective Right. That would be a really nice uh, opening if you could talk to us and help us understand what that means, being reflective. Right, right, right. That's a good question. And I think it is really important because one of the things in general, when um, someone has complex trauma in their history, is that understanding their responses goes a long way, goes a long way to feel, helping us feel soothed and settled. So this piece about it being reflexive, right? What does that mean? Well, it's essentially the same as um, the first time you got in a car behind the wheel to drive. Everything had to be conscious. 
and you were slow and you were clunky about it and it was hard to remember all the pieces. <clears throat> but each time you put yourself in the car behind the wheel to drive, your body starts to learn. Your body, your foot remembers which one's the gas, which one's the brake. Your eyes and your neck remember to glance into the rear view mirror. It stops being consciously chosen. Your body just does it. Why? Because the body, if we imagine a hypothetical conversation between the body and the mind here, the mind wants you to do a certain thing. And so it makes you do those actions. And the body is going, oh, okay, so this is what you want me to do. So this is what's a good idea for us as a whole being right now. And the body eventually says, oh, I got this. I'll take over. You free up space in the thinking mind for the other things that need your attention. And so in that way, just through repetition, what we do, our action patterns, we can call them, become automated. It's a very efficient process, right? Imagine if um, every time you went to eat, you had to consciously remember how to put the fork toward your mouth like you do when you're eight months old, right? So the process of automation and having these responses become reflexive is very, very efficient. Now, when it comes to what we might call trauma responses, it's even more important that they are not that they don't have to consult the slow thinking mind in order to move from impulse to action. And this is the case with all animals, right? In animals, it's easier because there is no thinking mind. They don't have, they don't have that piece, that cortical piece. Um, but they have to happen really fast, right? Survival responses have to be fast. And so we have parts of our body that even muscle responses that only go as far as the spinal cord. It's, I believe it's called the reflex arc. And then the spinal cord knows to contract the muscle. For instance, when a ball is coming toward us, right? And we block with our hand or we reflexively turn away. That doesn't even go that high in the nervous system because we need it to happen so fast and nerve cells can be very long. You don't want to travel a long route. And so there's a lot of what we as now adults, let's say, experience as old patterns, right? They originated when we were very young. They got repeated. And you can see now why they are automated. They arise spontaneously, um, a fight response, right? As somebody, you're driving along the road and someone um, it starts to veer into your lane, let's say. Your body's response to that, your jerk away, your pull, right? Those happen so fast because it's adaptive for them to happen that fast. The problem we run into is when the that pattern of response, right? We can call it that survival response that arises in our bodies automatically doesn't match the current situation. That's when we find, oh, wait a minute, this is causing problems for me in my life. That's when enough of that accumulates that we find ourselves in a therapist's office. It's so important for us to understand that because many of us didn't understand that. And then we would blame ourselves you know, why, why am I feeling like this? Why are you so anxious? Why mm -hmm. are you such a nervous wreck? <laughs> you know, not mm -hmm. understanding that it is, again, it's those patterns. It's, it's our biology. It's our survival mechanism that learn those things and that it's still trying to protect us. Yeah. Really right. good. Right. And just to highlight what you just said, it's our bodies that learned those things. Yes. Right. Our bodies learned those things and that's why they show up again. Yeah. Yeah. Because our bodies are trying to protect us. The reason I highlight that and it's so important is because many of us in general in our society don't think about our bodies doing what they do as we walk through our days. We sort of identify with our thinking mind and we may either not think about the body at all or like this body is something I drag along with me that's in the way. It's too tired or it's too, like you said, anxious or it's too whatever to be able to carry out what my mind commands it to do, right? And so it really is important. And in terms of doing somatic experiencing work, one of the 
things I love the most about that modality in particular is that we learn to, in the process of doing SE, we learn to relate to our bodies again in a way that listens to them and respects what they need when we hear signals of those needs and even to learn to trust my body's got this. Like my thinking mind can't lead me out of some emotional knot that I'm in. But over time, as you experience that with somatic experiencing, you develop a trust that like, oh, my body's got this. I can trust that my body will lead me to where it needs to go for settling to happen internally. Yeah, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about how many people who have had developmental trauma may not have experienced what settling is, you know, unless they have used perhaps um, a distraction or a numbing. So mm -hmm. the idea that eventually in time that your body can again, maybe for the first time, begin to show you that process of feeling settled. It's very hopeful. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's like you can eventually learn that being in my body, right? What people call embodiment, but really more specifically, it's being aware of, connected to the sensations of my body can actually be an okay place to visit, right? Instead of being not in our bodies, right? Leaving that neighborhood by distracting ourselves or more strongly numbing ourselves out, right? Disconnecting ourselves from feeling our bodies. Yeah. I wanna say something else too about this point. And you're right that it's so common, right? Um, to maybe even feel it for the first time. And that's also one of the things I personally have found that somatic experiencing over some of what's the other modalities that I've trained in and practiced for years, Somatic experiencing is clear and acknowledges the importance of building that up, building up your almost storehouse of felt sense experiences of pleasantness and that it's essential for healing. Um, again, sometimes our thinking minds, they They've been taught, of course, by, you know, other therapists and society and books that we read um, what somatic methods call a top down method that I want to feel settled. I don't want to feel this unsettled, whatever the nature of the unsettled is, whether it's shame or anger or anxiety or numb and disconnected. Right. I want to feel settled. How can I do that? Well, do yoga, do meditation, do breathing exercises force yourself to do the things that you fear and the fear will gradually whittle down. All of those methods do work for some people. That's why those methods still exist. And there's a whole laundry, long list of other methods as well. Um, but somatic experiencing um, helps us get there, not by practice this exercise in order to make your body feel calm for a moment. Somatic work is the other direction. And this is really important because often I'll sit with folks and we're doing SC and their reflex response of making relaxation come comes in because they've practiced that a lot in various sort of uh, pockets of their life. Somatic experiencing says, okay, so you're feeling anxiety. Where do we feel it? Where is it right now showing up in your body? Let's say it's showing up in your chest feels tight. Okay. Now let's look for, is there any other place in your body already right now that feels different than tight? The curiosity is, is there a place that's already not tight, already not what we're calling anxious? So it's different than inducing relaxation. It's discovering what part of me actually feels okay already. And it might just be, my toes in these sandals, I like it. They feel free. They can move. Okay. We start there, right? 
And so that then becomes almost like one body part communicating with another body part. And we have this exercise in SE where they sort of, you, we toggle our awareness back and forth between those parts. And we notice oftentimes shift happens in the body, not because we made it happen, but because we brought our awareness to what was already present. And it can be, uh, you know, part of the body. It could be some aspect of your space around you that when you look at it, Ooh, something just exhales in me, something drops and loosens, right? And there's a number of other, you know, go-tos that somatic therapists can guide you to that become then resources. Yeah, that's great. But that's a challenge for folks to understand this. Yeah, when we're working with our own systems using SE, working with an SE therapist, just to sort of grasp this sort of bottom-up method. It sometimes takes some work if our method for survival has been, I need to understand it with my mind, plan it, execute it, and make it happen, you know, and that's our survival strategy. That in itself takes time in SE to loosen and start to trust that the body actually can change without the command center mind commanding it, you know. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i even thinking about myself, I don't know how many years ago, I think when it, I went to a, um, an SC uh, practitioner, I think when SC, I don't want to say when SC first came out, but when I first found out about it, I don't know if it was like eight years ago, 10 years ago, I sat there and I didn't even know what was going on. That's how full that's how foreign it felt to me, <laughs> like completely yeah. foreign, because like you said, I was expecting to use my mind. And suddenly yeah. she's asking me about what's going on in my body. What does it feel like? What color? What shape? I'm like, what is going on here? What on earth does this have to do with my trauma? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. And I can relate. I remember the very first SE practitioner that I tried myself. <laughs> Um, it was a similar reaction. And, um, you know, just like you, I had this question of like, I came here for SE. I read Waking the Tiger. I expect it like, isn't this supposed to make me feel better? Aren't I supposed to have some release to my anxiety, you know? And so, of course, I came in with all those expectations. Um, so I actually find that when I sit with folks who have developmental trauma, especially when it's real young and when it's um, what we might call global, right? So like, the whole system is activated and it feels like the what we call activation is just sort of the internal charge right of the of the the energy of this trapped trauma response and it can like ping a pinball around inside you you know it's like oh and i feel it in my chest oh, now i feel it in my uh, stomach and my back and now my head and right and i actually find that psychoeducation um with clients really helps so that they know okay even this notice the discomfort that arises right now as I ask you to look around the room and that response, like it might be irritation that comes up in the person. It might be that they go numb and freeze, whatever. Guess what? That's your trauma response. It's already shown itself, right? And so for people who have developmental trauma, complex PTSD, it doesn't take a big trigger to evoke those self-protective trauma responses. It can be a real small trigger like that and then oh look we see here it is and here's our work so when for me when I work with folks who have real young trauma that way I do a lot of explaining because the explaining although SE is not a top-down method but if their usual strategy for finding and feeling safety in their world is through conscious knowing we work with what the strength is and gradually ease them into more familiarity and okayness, trusting that sensations in the body are also okay. Like, why not start with their strength and then water and fertilize the little seed that we're going for, which is ultimately having a larger capacity to be present to, to allow and sit with the painful stuff as it arises in the body, the tension the fluttering, the waves of heat, 
us sometimes trembling, right? That can really freak us out initially. We don't have capacity for it initially. So there's a gentleness in somatic experiencing that eases you into those gradually expands your capacity to be with them. Because when we can be with them, that's when finally what began some at some point in the past, the self-protective response that reflexively came to life in your body back then, but didn't get a chance to complete that's when it gets a chance to complete is when we can allow the body to do its thing. Does that make sense? I think you should elaborate on that a little more. Okay. So <clears throat> being with gradually developing more capacity to be with and allow the body sensations that are related to the trauma responses to be in our body, that's sort of a, a an initial step, right? Although it's throughout Somatic experiencing and what people often, um, the idea that they have when they've read, for instance, Waking the Tiger, Peter Levine's first book, um, they have this notion about like, oh, I have this incomplete fight response or this incomplete flight response. And I know it's still sort of zinging around in my body and I want to go into somatic experiencing and complete it. Um, but until we have built up the capacity to stay present to the body sensations without getting completely overwhelmed by them, right? Our level of internal activation going up, 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 and up until we go into a freeze state. Because we have to sit with <clears throat> and maintain our witnesser awareness. We sit with the sensations. We witness them slowly. We witness impulses, not big actions, but the impulse before the action. And then is there an action that the body wants to do? And it's all quite slow. So we need a lot of capacity to be with that, right? And then once we can sit with, while staying aware and connected with our, our consciousness, our awareness, staying present to the sensations, that's then when these old responses of, oh, I wanted to um, run out of the room, when my dad would start screaming at me for getting a bad grade, let's say, you know, or whatever it was, or for not washing the dishes the right way. Um, I wanted to run out of the room. Well, your body was poised at that time at whatever age to run out of the room. The muscles were already ready, but there was some reason that your body suppressed that response. Well, what happens to all that readiness? Well, it stays there. That readiness stays in the system. And then it didn't ever like complete. It, it it wanted to take you out of the room. It wanted to have you run into your room and hide under the covers or run to uh, someone's house. But you stayed there because perhaps you knew it's going to be worse. I'm going to get more yelled at, more of this threat on me if I follow that response. So you suppress it. It doesn't mean mentally. It might be consciously you actually suppress it. It might be your body suppresses it for you. What happens to it? It stays. And that's what we mean by those survival responses that got mobilized and ready to move us to a place of more safety, but got blocked for some reason. They stay ready in the body. And it's actually that physiological readiness that has had no outlet that we actually experience as quote unquote symptoms. When you have that education and you understand that there's a, a normalizing and then I find yeah. a relaxing. For oh, sure. You know, there's no shame in that, that my body is carrying. And for many, like you talked about, the body was ready. And those of us with complex and developmental trauma, that could have happened, I don't know, millions of times. So yeah. imagine all of that readiness with nowhere to go that thwarted response um mm -hmm. i shared this before on the podcast but it just reminds me like i had experiences personally where i wanted to run away like i i mm. that's quite clear like my body got all ready and i wanted to race and run and it was repetitive anyway when i became a young mom and i didn't know what was going on and something triggered it i literally would feel first frozen stuck in one place and i'd be going what is go this makes what is going on I couldn't move mm. Mm. and then I would finally grab my car keys and race out the door get in the car and go 
And that was like, I did that so many times. And when I think about it now, didn't know then, I was asking therapists, what, what's happening? Why am I doing this? Mm. Because mm. you have anxiety. But anyway, um, now I understand I, my body was trying mm. to do what it wasn't able to do back then. And, and that's incredible mm -hmm. to me, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, you know, the answer that you got from therapists because you have anxiety, well, it's not inaccurate. It's just not complete enough for you to fully understand. So the question I like to ask is, well, you have anxiety. Okay. And what does the anxiety want? What's the anxiety trying to do, right? What we experience is anxiety. And again, in somatic experiencing, we ground it back again into the sensation. So let's say in this case, anxiety was my legs want to move. There's a lot of energy in my legs. My feet can't sit still. Huh. What does that energy, what does that part of your body want to do? So it's this assumption that not, oh, the anxiety is a bad thing we need to get rid of. But in fact, anxiety as the sensations of it, the impulse to move is our body helping us survive what it experienced as threatening. Do you see what I mean? It's sort of like we ask, we ask the body, what do you want to do? What's the impulse? Now, obviously, it's not the same kind of threat. You know, you described I'm having a baby and I'm overwhelmed. I mean, you've had the baby and the baby's doing what babies do, crying, or being upset or whatever. So there's overwhelm. That's not the same threat that originally evoked that desire to flee, right? So we see a mismatch and you're aware there's a mismatch and the therapist, non-SE or non so much trauma-informed therapist can see it's a mismatch. Um, but then doesn't go back to, well, what is the impulse of the original, yeah, movement that wanted to happen? And what can we do to help it complete? And you don't actually have to, I mean, I can ask you this, Monique, how many times did you find that you grabbed your car keys and drove off and there was probably a, possibly like a momentary relief, but then when you came back in, it would arise again and it would arise again and it would arise again. And so those big, big, literally big physical movements that we feel the impulse to do, right? Those actually aren't what release that trapped energy. This is the other thing that can be surprising with somatic work is that let's say someone feels anger. They don't actually have to punch a pillow or scream uh, for an hour in a room that's or deep in the woods where no one can hear them. Um, it's not those big movements with the body that tap into the energy right, of that impulse, but rather still keeping it slow so that the conscious mind can stay with the process and observing and working with the impulses and little movements, right? <clears throat> and that's the piece that can feel surprising to people that I don't actually have to punch someone. I don't have to sign up for a kickboxing class in order to get that, say, anger energy or fight energy out of my system. Okay, so you're saying something important here. So you're saying it's the staying with the little impulses, even if it, we're thinking it's running out the door or punching the bag. Can you explain what that could look like, little impulses, when let's say it was a big event or it was a big thing that your body had wanted to do? Mm -hmm. Why is it important to stay with little impulses? Um, because, well, one of the, one of the things that when we when we teach when we give SE to clients when we um, teach in trainings because I assist in SD trainings, what you'll hear is um, it's about I want to use the metaphor the size of the bite that the body is given to chew and digest, right? So if someone um, experienced a major let's say a car accident or something, right? Um, their body responded very quickly. Um, or let's say someone is, this is an example, Peter Levine gives us in one of his books, you're standing at an ATM and you 
hear some people off to one side and you notice and your body will start to respond a little bit, but you don't yet fully know that they're going to come up and pull a gun on you and, you know, mug you for your ATM money. Um, and so what we want to do in SC is bring someone back to that initial moment where their body response started to get activated. At what point did you initially first feel something might be wrong? Because the body is already having responses to the initial signs. Um, if you if you think of, and this is again one of the things I personally like about SC, if you think about how animals in the world respond to overwhelming and life-threatening events, there's a process of initially noticing subtle cues from your surroundings, and there's this paying attention that happens. You pay attention, you stop the other thing you were doing. Your body will pause and take in through your senses information so that the body can evaluate safe or threat. What are we what are we working with here? What is this? So the body's already responding in those early stages. And when we work with SC, we work with small amounts of this large, you know, globus, you can say, of activation in the body small amounts at a time so that um you the classic example that's given is like the old science science fair sixth grade science project of making a volcano right you mix baking soda and vinegar and if you put them all together all at once boom, you have this big fizzy explosion and it spills over and makes a big mess but if you had the goal of combining these two, the base and the acid together, and you combined um, just like a, a pinch of the baking soda into the vinegar at a time, you would see some alka seltzer fizz. That's what Peter Levine likes to call it. It'll fizz up and then it'll settle. And now that's neutralized. And then you take another pinch and you drop it into the vinegar. And then that fizzes. And with some time, it'll settle and that's neutralized. And so what might have felt like an undigestible mountain of, in this case, baking soda, right? Metaphorically trauma. We've actually metabolized and digested it all because we worked on only a pinch at a time. And so that's the idea is that when the body gets filled with so much of the trauma energy, it can get overwhelmed. But if we just take a little piece and then bring the body back to settling or give it time, I should say, give the body time to bring itself back to settle. And then we check in and see if the body is ready for another little bite. Does that um, feel like it gives you an yes. idea of what you're asking? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it also makes sense that um, <clears throat> I think it'd be easier for the body to take it in slowly because... Yeah. Trauma is that whole experience was too much, too fast at one time to digest and to like, sometimes you think about it, you're like, I don't even know what happened. It was just, but, but it happened and it was awful. And the idea of, yeah, digesting it slowly in order to be with it too. In order bring to bring awareness. Be with it. Yeah. Makes a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah. And I think part of that too is considering the freeze response. You know, when when a body goes into um, when when a when a body, of course, mammals, but I'm thinking actually other animals too, birds and stuff. When the threat feels um, too overwhelming to escape or fight off, the nerve, the body will send the creature into a free state. And so, uh, therapies themselves that don't have a sensitivity to keeping the person's physiology within the range that they can tolerate can send a body into an overwhelm and a freeze state. And that's one of the complaints that um, is often levied against some of the behavior therapies, which those, those methods are effective, but not for everyone. And they have a high dropout rate. Why? Well, it might be because the people who drop out need smaller bites at a time and to let the Alka-Seltzer fizz settle out before they move into the next element of the same memory of the trauma. 
Um, and again, um, I got trained in those methods long ago and used them with my work in the VA system and other people. And I like somatic experiencing better because it's um, it it works with smaller bites so that the process that you're working on with the therapist itself isn't re-traumatizing and overwhelming. You're making me think of um, of therapy. And one of the things that can be challenging for people when they're starting out in therapy, or maybe not even when they're starting out, maybe just in therapy, is, um, you know, how if you have a system that really never learned what is a safe person, what what would you say could be helpful in um, recognizing or knowing or helping your body to know if, if, if a therapist is safe for you? Because often mm -hmm. we just, you know, okay, they're a therapist. Okay, they're trained. Okay, they went to, you know, they did all the trainings. Okay, that's it. So what, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, I think it's a really good question and an important question, you know when we go out into this giant ocean of potential helpers and guides, coaches, healers, therapists, whatever you want to call them, how do we pick one that is going to help, right? And what if we are going in as a person who has generally not consulted our bodies about what's the right thing for me, right? So we, we bring even to that decision the typical disconnect or the typical override that we feel of our bodies, just like we do to all the other decisions. So, so one thing I would, uh, I, I encourage and I emphasize is to listen to what your body tells you when you talk with a potential therapist, when you're sort of maybe phone interviewing them a little bit for a few minutes, or when you sit down with them the first time or two, what does that mean? Listen to your body that even that can be, well, what is that? Well, some people feel a gut feeling, right? Some people feel internally there's just a no, no, I don't want to be in the room with you. Or um, sometimes I've, when I've done this process myself, I've encountered therapists and I'm like, no, you're not heavyweight enough. You're not heavyweight enough to deal with my system, <laughs> right? I mean, because when we have systems that have kind of global activation, it started very young. And it affects lots and lots of different sort of domains of our lives. We want to be with someone who we just feel, oof, they've got the gravitas to hold what I've got. And we can kind of feel that with our bodies. So what I encourage people to do is let themselves really pay attention to those signals, those gut feelings, right, for lack of a better word. And um, when it does feel like it's clicking, what it can feel like is, Oh, when I sit in the presence of this person, some part of me feels some ease. Some part of me can soften or oh, just let go of the work that it does to protect itself all the time. Right. So that's a nice signal when that arises in your body. Now, what can also happen when our bodies loosen or ease up a little bit that way is tears come up for us right in inner emotional pain oh now there's space let's let's bring some tears up and so um that can then lead to oh no let's say someone has you know a belief about tears that um it's a belief or just a body experience of tears isn't okay so then it can feel like oh i sit with this person i feel some comfort but then my tears come up and then now the ball's rolling, basically. Your trauma response is here. <laughs> and so now you have the work to face. Um, that's the other thing is that I think it's also very reasonable and fair for clients to repeatedly check in with themselves about, does the work that I'm doing with this person still feel helpful? You know, let's say it felt helpful for the first chunk of our work. Does it still feel helpful? Is this still the place for me? Right. And those are those are good, reasonable questions to ask ourselves as clients, because as we grow, we might outgrow a particular therapist's skill level. Right. Or um, just their presence, their validation, their acceptance, their kindness 
it might be something that we need to fill up on. But then let's say, like you mentioned earlier, there's a, they uh, tend to work more with the thoughts and the meaning of things than with say emotions or with our body sensations. And we find like, that's actually the direction I feel inclined to go. So you can bring it up with your therapist and talk with them about it. And maybe they have the capacity to lean in the direction that your body wants. And maybe they don't. And that's also fine. And then it's a way of really respecting what is my body telling me it needs right now. Um, and we can practice that everywhere, not just when we accept or don't accept an invitation to a social gathering or what job or not, or, jo you know, do I want to do or not do, but also is this therapist taking me to the state of my being, right? Taking me into states of being that is the direction I want to grow in. Yeah, that's really good. Really, really helpful. I've seen that with um, with some people that sometimes come to see me. And I notice that um, I, I always feel good when when they say that, when they're like, you know, I've, I've realized the therapist was really, really helpful, really good. But I felt like I could, I got everything I needed. And I'm thinking, yeah. that, that's just so good that you were able to yeah. recognize that and do something about that. I mean, we can't, uh, we can't underestimate how important actually that is because you just made a huge, uh, you just did a huge disconfirming experience because you listened to your body and you did something for it that it, it told you, it gave you information that you needed. And I just think that's so good, but yes, listening to the body great um and what's disconfirming about that as you mentioned disconfirming experience the piece that's disconfirming is potentially the belief or the past experience you had that listening to myself and saying i've actually had enough mm -hmm. no thank you to more you witness yourself doing that and you've disconfirmed that doing that is unsafe yeah. that's mm -hmm. what you've disconfirmed or the therapist can give you that like disconfirming evidence right mm -hmm. by saying like i love that you're telling me now sense mm -hmm. into how that feels you know? yeah and the other piece too is that and that's how i i see it too is that healing is a it's it's a lifestyle and i'll even say a lifelong journey okay maybe not for all of us but for a lot of us and that along the way you may receive something from the from the first um, therapeutic relationship you have, then you move to something else and some other type of work you might do, and that's helpful and good. Mm -hmm. And then something else, and and you just see that healing is also cumulative, just like trauma is. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I. I the where I am, I, I like that you you describe and I agree that the process of healing is gradual and it happens over time. Mm. And people whose bodies started to experience overwhelm um, without the balancing out of like settling, safety, mm -hmm. being held and all of that, the younger, the more frequent and the more sort of um, life-threatening the experience is, the longer it stays with us. Our body, in, in other words, learns those lessons really, really well, right? And so it can be very much a decades-long process. Um, I've gotten to the point where I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the thing that unlocked that okayness for me um, has been this new experience with myself with my body really of like okay body I'm here with you I got you tell me show me I'm listening mm -hmm. and so whatever it shows me whether it's like oh I feel this great song and I'm or I'm listening to a comedian on YouTube and the body is fe feeling and doing joy and excitement mm -hmm. I'm like woo, you go right <laughs> and when my body is contracting or feeling jittery or parts of me have gone numb. 
I'm like, oh, body, what are you telling me you need right now? Mm. And so that's one of my favorite practices currently is just this relating like a partner Mm -hmm. to my body and its signals. And we sort of walk through the world as a team rather than a master and a slave, (sighs) rather than a mind dominating over and commanding the body to do its bidding. And meanwhile, the body is like exhausted or limping along or trying to protest, but its protests aren't being heard by the mind. And um, so much of our modern culture is about overriding Mm -hmm. the body. And I know other folks who have talked on your podcast too have talked about um, how we have to ask permission in school to go use the toilet. (laughs) Like we aren't supposed to, as little four-year-olds, touch other kids. <laughs> That's not natural. No, <laughs> you know, as as a primate is not natural. As a social animal, it's mm. not natural. You know, and so there's so much um, cultural programming that we get to override. We we, we get told to override. Mm what our body signals are. So for me, it just, I just puts a smile on my face every time I practice teaming up with my body Mm -hmm. instead of that division. Yeah. I really like what you're saying because I I would agree. I think at the beginning of our journey, we often think that our bodies are enemy because, Hey, you're causing, Mm -hmm. I'm at this therapy because of you, you're causing me all this distress. You're, you're Mm -hmm. the reason when in reality, like it's, it's just trying to to be our protector, to care for us, to keep us safe. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. It, so that's uh, the intention mm-hmm. is always good. Yeah. And even deeper than that, the quote unquote answers to what's the way out of this, the body is the one that knows those answers. The body is the part of us that knows what's the movement that my shoulder needs to make right now to finish something that got started and never finished before. What's the movement that my throat or my vocal cords need to make, right? It's not the thinking mind that knows those things. It's the body that holds that knowledge. You know, and that, that's really what it means when you hear folks who do somatic work talk about the wisdom in the body is that You know, if you think about a a gazelle out in the wild or a possum out in the wild, their bodies have the knowledge and the wisdom of how to move back out of intense survival responses like freeze or flight or fight or collapse, right? Their bodies know. Oh, wow. Well, if we, if you agree that human beings are also just a species of animal, what if our bodies actually know? And th- and that's what I love about SE. You know, I've for decades and even back as far as graduate school, I studied um, evolutionary psychology, right? Where it looks at could there, is there an adaptive function behind some of what we call our psychology, mm. our emotional states, let's say, you know, withdrawal into depression, jealousy, um, <clears throat> Uh, protecting and guarding your partner from other people who might, you know, uh, um, tempt them to stray. You know, all those sorts of things. Evolutionary psychology is fascinating. And somatic experiencing as a type of um, therapy for what we always thought of as psychological trauma, it's the one that I've discovered that actually takes into account that we are a mammal. We are a primate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we have that... Mm-hmm that um, neurological and physiological underpinning to yeah. our quote unquote psychology. That's, yeah. that's why I love it so much. You know, when I think of um, states that my body gets into, I'm, I re- bring to mind, I recall, you know, videos that I've seen about a gazelle trembling and shaking off the intense overwhelm underneath the animal's freeze response after almost being eaten by a predator. Mm-hmm shaking it off and then it's done. They bounce back to their feet and they trot off. And so I have a respect even for the real scary body states now of like the trembling. Mm. And when we feel that the trembling is the one that can really freak people out the most when their bodies go into trembling and, oh my God, this is bad. I'm falling apart. You start to judge it and you do everything you can to suppress it. 
And it's nice to be able to now have a respect of like, oh, it's my, I think to myself, oh, that's my gazelle self. <laughs> that's, the, <laughs> and I just kind of personify it that way or um, think of it with that image and just allow the process, the body to do what it needs to do. <laughs> this was so enjoyable. I really, really enjoyed it. And we got Likewise. to go Thanks a little so deeper. Much. Oh, you're so welcome. Yeah, I always, um, sometimes I find that, not that there's a mystery, but people want to know more about like what does somatic therapies entail? And because mm -hmm. I find it personally one of the most helpful therapies out there. Mm -hmm. I, I want to see how can we make it digestible? How can we explain what's ha what does what happens in one of those sessions and stuff? So yeah. I think that our conversation was was really, really helpful. And maybe I'll have you back again. Yeah, so I'm thank glad. you. For oh, today. I would love to. It was a joy to sit with you, Monique. Thank you. If you'd like to meet for a one to one consult to find out more about my trauma recovery coaching offerings and resources, you can visit my website at thehealingtraumapodcast.com.